I mean, physical prowess is something, and, and it's not nothing, that physical confidence that comes along with that as well. But the same thing replicated at the level of the ability to communicate and to think, and that's way broader field of battle and opportunity. And this is one thing that isn't taught well, especially to boys. There's nothing that makes you more formidable than verbal competence and being able to articulate, be able to think, to marshal your arguments, right? It's a battlefield metaphor. Get everything in order, all your information straight you know, to marshal your forces. I mean, that's part of the reason that rap artists are so popular, especially among disaffected young men, black and white alike, because they're unbelievably articulate. Like they have this incredible verbal prowess it's unbelievably attractive, you know, and it's associated with genuine artistic and redemptive activity, often focusing on something that's approximately the voice of the underclass, let's say. It's interesting to see how many young white guys identify with that. Hey, it's Evan Carmichael, and I make these videos because in my first business, I was making 300 bucks a month. I quit on my business partner, and the thing that saved me was studying the stories of super successful entrepreneurs. So I hope that this story today helps give you the motivation you need because I still need it to myself. So today, let's live your best believe life and get some incredible motivation from the one and only Jordan Peterson. Enjoy. Was it Aldous Huxley that wrote Doors of Perception? Yeah. Yeah. So... This is kind of an equivalent of that, right? That you have a experience which many people struggle to articulate. You take the best of us, the one that has the most precise, most articulate, mm -hmm. erudite language. Mm -hmm. You drop them in and you say, okay, show us what you've learned. Mm -hmm. This is the equivalent, but for just a different community, a different sort of life, mm -hmm. that maybe you don't have the ability to describe what it feels like to live on a council estate in Manchester or in you know, the, one of the neighborhoods of Brooklyn or whatever it might be. And then this person can, mm -hmm. and it feels like it's your voice. Yeah, well you still, if you're a young man, you still feel alienated from your place as rightful heir of the proper kingdom. I mean, that's an existential truism for everyone, for every, particularly for every young man, because he is an outsider in many ways. He's young and juvenile and not very highly valued. And, and then is, is, in some sense, hurt by the inadequacies of the current king, the current culture, and, and it is easily turned against it because of that. And that's the machinations of the evil uncle. That's the King Arthur story. That's the story of Horus, Hor Horus and Osiris. It's an ancient, ancient story. It's the story of Sauron, and um, it's there all the time. And you see in that, in rap music, in hip hop, the, the, all of that alienation being given an articulated voice in, in an artistic sense. And that's a good example of the power of verbal facility. And that's the route to, let's say, marketing education to young men. It's like, you want to you wanna take your rightful place in the kingdom? It's like, get your tongue straight, man. Get it under control in the highest possible sense. We went to a comedy club, Tammy and I, and in uh, New York, the Comedy Cellar. It's a great comedy club. And the last comic was an English guy. And uh, he was uh, not particularly physically prepossessing, and he, he made a lot of jokes about that. And it was quite funny. And then he divided the audience into five sections, and he asked each section to toss up a topic, just to yell out a topic. And they were like random topics like the Kennedy assassination and electric lighting before 1890. Those were two of the topics. And the other three were just as diverse. And then he put on some beats, and. He did a, about an eight minute rap with every verse rhymed and he tied the whole thing together at the end and mm -hmm. ended at the end of the music all spontaneously. It was unbelievable. And that's Logos, man. That's the redemptive power of the Logos right there. The magic word, the sacred word. It's just manifesting itself on stage. There's something Very impressive. That, something about that that does feel dangerous as well. In, not in a... I need to be concerned and this should be contaminated and walled off, but in a way that you think that person has so much competence mm -hmm. that it, it's flowing out of them. Mm -hmm. And you almost feel competent by being around them. Mm -hmm. so but you certainly feel competent by appreciating it, yeah. right? Because it speaks to the part of you that is capable of appreciating such things. You think, wow, that's really something. That's really, that's an amazing display. That's an amazing thing to see. Amazing, right? A very interesting word, amazing. And, you're, you're trapped and you're trapped by the charisma of that. And that charisma, that's not nothing. That's, that's a signal of something redemptive occurring. That, that accounts for 
virtually all of the attraction of hip hop and rap is the articulated, articulated voice of the struggling but worthy underclass, I suppose that's a good way of putting it. But those who are alienated from their rightful place. And so that verbal prowess is one of the ways they struggle up towards the light. In a, and and that, that's a good example of that, uh, of having that danger under control, because it's a dark genre in many ways, right? It's, it's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a real undercurrent, an air of violence that surrounds that and its culture like the punk movement in the in 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 the UK back in the late 70s same same sort of thing but that that capacity to express that in a poetic manner uh, in a compelling manner Sid or uh, Johnny Rotten was great at that he was so intense his he worked with PIL afterwards public Im Pu public image limited is that is it? public image I think so he has a song called rise which I used to show my my clients all the time when I was starting uh, a, uh, assertiveness training with them, I'd put on Johnny Rotten's rise and the line in there is anger is an energy. And he's got these unbelievably intense eyes. Anger and, is an energy. You bet. And John Lydon, man, he could channel that like almost no one I've ever seen. He'd get that anger built up inside him. And then it was completely under control and he expressed it in his music. And he's absolutely captivating unbelievably charismatic and I really liked his music that raw anger in the music that but it was it was in the bloody music wasn't it, it wasn't some random riot you know he transmuted that into something you know you can argue about the poetic merits of um of punk rock although I don't think you should I mean uh I did it my way Sid Vicious's version of I did it my way my god that's a work of genius that it's so it's so brilliantly satirical Rule number two is pursue your goals. We know enough about psychology now to know that almost all of the positive emotion that you're going to experience in your life, and positive emotion is analgesic, by the way, right? It actually quells pain. So it's not just positive. It also gets rid of negative, which is a big plus. Almost all the positive emotion that you're going to feel, you're going to feel in relationship to a goal because you feel positive emotion as you approach a goal. And so if you want to feel positive emotion, then you need a goal. And then you might think, well, if you want to maximize that positive emotion, which is enthusiasm and also what pulls you out into the world as well as feeling good, then you need the best possible goal. Well, that, because that's going to engage the largest segments of your being. Like if your goal is too narrow, then a bunch of you isn't going to be on board for it, you know? If the goal is well-developed and multifaceted, then all of you can partake in that. Even your negative elements, even your anger and, and, and your fear can get on board with that, let's say. So you need a goal, man, that's worthy. You got to think, you, got, you need a goal that justifies the tragedy and malevolence of life. That seems to be the bottom line. Now, maybe you think, well, there's no goal that can do that. It's like, well, There are still better and worse goals. So, and I, I'm not convinced that there are no goals that can do that. I think that's an open question. You'd never know that until you pursued the proper goal long enough to find out who you would be as a consequence of pursuing it. So that's also your destiny or your existential voyage, right? It's also not something that anyone else can do for you. Someone can say, get your act together for Christ's sake and get, it, get, get at it. That's... That'll make the world unfold best for you, but there's no way you can know that without doing it. So, and unless you think you've done a particularly stellar job of that, then you have no reason to doubt its potential validity. So plus, like crickets are telling you this, and so, <laughs> <laughs> you know, they're a very reliable source. Okay, so you see the star, the star recurs as a motif in Pinocchio, and one of the more interesting elements of it here is that when Geppetto wants to transform his puppet, the marionette who's being played by forces that operate behind the scenes, which is a really good definition of the persona from a Jungian perspective, right? And also something indicative of something like an ideological or conceptual possession. Geppetto, who's a good guy, is a positive father figure, re lifts his, even though he's a patriarchal figure, right? and a very competent one, he still even lifts his eyes up to something that transcends his mode of being, positive as it is, and wishes that his creation would 
undertake the kind of transformation that would make it autonomous and fully functional as a moral agent. No strings, right? So that's very interesting, I think. Solzhenitsyn said, the salvation of mankind lies only in making everything the concern of all. That's a pretty decent star-like goal, I would say. And so what happens in the Pinocchio story is that because, and I think this is a symbolic representative of what I just described to you that happens at a genetic level if you put yourself in new situations. So Geppetto is roughly culture in the Pinocchio story, right? He's, he's a craftsman, he's, he's a, and, and he makes Pinocchio. So he's, he's, who's his son? He's the socializing agent. And he aims for something above mere socialization, which is, I think, part of the mysterious element of human beings. You know, in our scientific models, we basically have socialization and biology. But there's always a third element in mythological stories, which is whatever you might construe as the spontaneous action of consciousness that's associated with free will. And, you know, that's just basically being conceptualized in religious terms as something akin to the soul. Now, we don't have a category for that scientifically because... What we try to do scientifically is to reduce everything either to socialization or to biology. But it isn't clear to me that that's, it's perfectly reasonable from the perspective of practicality at a scientific level. You don't want to multiply explanatory principles beyond necessity. But there's many things that that doesn't come to terms with, such as the fact that we all treat each other as autonomous beings with free will. And that that seems to work, and that if we stop doing that, then things go to hell very, very rapidly. So... And the mere fact that we have been able to conceptualize what that conscious free will might be, metaphysically or physically, doesn't mean it doesn't exist. It just means that we don't understand it. I mean, what, it was only in the last 15 years that we discovered that 95% of the universe was made out of some kind of matter that we can't even, whose properties we can't even imagine, except that it seems to have mass. So, anyways, what happens is when Geppetto reached lifts his eyes up to the star. He, so it's society aligning itself with the proper goal with regards to individual development, right? So, so there, instead of society being at odds with the individual, they line up. And then what happens is nature comes on board, and that's the blue fairy in the, in the Pinocchio story, and that seems to me to be a symbolic representation of what happens biologically when, when you set the goal properly get your culture behind you and move into the world is that there's a biological transformation that occurs as a consequence of that, which means that a bunch of you that hasn't been turned on, turns on. And I guess one question would be is, what would you be like if you turned on everything inside of you that could be turned on? Well, that's a good goal. That's a good thing to find out. So, now, I'm going to introduce a couple of other ideas. So, there's this idea in Jungian psychology called the circumambulation. And Jung had this idea that you had a potential future self, which would be in potential, everything that you could be. And that it manifests itself moment to moment in your present life by making you interested in things. And the things that you're interested in are the things that would guide you along the path that would lead you to maximal development. Now, it sounds like a metaphysical idea or a or a mystical idea even, but, but it's not, it's, it's not. It's a really profoundly biological idea. The idea is something like, well, you're set up so that you're automatically interested in those things that would fully expand you as a well-adapted creature. Well, like, there's nothing radical about that idea. How el what else could possibly be the case? Unless there's something fundamentally flawed about you, that is what the the situation would be. It's kind of interesting to think about how that would be manifest moment to moment, but the idea is something like, well, your interest is captured by those things that lead you down the path of development. Well, that better be the case. Okay, so that's fine. And so there's some utility in pursuing those things that you're interested in. That's the call to adventure, let's say. So, and the call to adventure takes you all sorts of places. Now, the problem with the call to adventure is like, what the hell do you know? you might be interested in things that are kind of warped and bent. And often it's the case that when new parts of people manifest themselves and grip their interests, say, they do it very badly and shoddily. 
And so you stumble around like an idiot when you try to do something new. That's why the fool is the precursor to the savior from the, from the symbolic perspectives, because you have to be a fool before you can be a master. And if you're not willing to be a fool, then you can't be a master. So, so you're gonna, it's, it's an error, <clears throat> error-ridden process. And that's also laid out in the Old Testament stories because the first thing that happens to all these patriarchal figures when God kicks them out of their father's house when they're like 84 is that they, they run into all sorts of trouble and some of it's social and some of it's natural and some of it's a consequence of their own moral inadequacy. So they're fools. And, but, but the thing that's so interesting is that despite the fact that they're fools, they're still supposed to go on the adventure and that they're capable of learning enough as a consequence of moving forward on the adventure so that they straighten themselves out across time. And so it's something like this. So this circumambulation that Jung talked about was this continual, we'll return to this, this continual circling in some sense of who you could be. You might notice, for example, that there are themes in your life. You know, when you go back across your experiences, you see you kind of have your typical experience that sort of repeats itself. And there might be variation on it, like a musical theme, but it's, it's like, you're, you're circling yourself and getting closer to yourself as you move across time. That's the circumambulation. Now, you remember that for a sec, because we'll go back to it. Okay, so imagine that something glimmers before you. It's an, an interest that's dawning, and you decide, well, first of all, you're paralyzed. You think, well, how do I know if I should pursue that? It's probably a stupid idea. And the proper response to that is, you're right, it probably is a stupid idea, because almost all, all ideas are stupid. And so, the, the probability that as you move forward on your adventure that you're going to get it right the first time is zero. It's just not going to happen. And so then you might think, well, maybe I'll just wait around until I get the right idea, and which people do, right? So they're like 40-year-old, 13-year-olds, which is not a good idea. And so they wait around until it's waiting for Godot, until... They finally got it right, but the problem is you're too stupid to know when you've got it right. So waiting around isn't going to help because even if it, the perfect opportunity manifested itself to you in your incomplete form, the probability that you would recognize it as the perfect opportunity is zero. You might even think it's the worst possible idea that you've ever heard of anywhere. Highly likely. Highly likely. So, so you have, there's, Nietzsche, Nietzsche called that a will, will to stupidity, which I really liked. So, because he thought of stupidity as being, it, you know, it's, it's, you have to take it into account fundamentally and work with it. And so, and so you can take these tentative steps on your pathway to destiny and you can assume that you're going to do it badly. And that's really useful because you don't have to beat yourself up. It's pretty easy to do it badly. But the thing is, it's way better to do it badly than not to do it at all. And that's the a continual message that echoes through these historical stories in Genesis. It's like, these are flawed people. They, they should have got the hell out of their house way before they did. Um, and they go out and they stumble around in tyranny and famine and self-betrayal and, and violence. And, but it's a hell of a lot better than just rotting away at home. Rule number three, slay the dragon. I can tell why the dragon hoards treasure everywhere. The dragon is an amalgam of predatory stimuli in, and fire, which is a destructive force, but also very useful. So dragon is something like predatory destructive entity. And you might say, well, is that real? It's like, well, yeah, but it's a meta category. It's like there are lions and raptors and um, lizards, let's say, uh, 60 million years ago when we were st still in trees, the idea that there's a meta predator is a great idea. A meta predator is what all predators share in common. That's a dragon. Well, what should you do with a dragon? Well, avoid it. That's one answer. Another answer is burn it out of its lair so that it doesn't have baby dragons. The, and the, uh, uh, an even more sophisticated answer is, well, confront it. You can feed your family with the body of a dragon. It's treasure. And then that's become abstracted up into the unknown as such. You do a great job of uh, telling the story of Tiamat, Marduk, all of that in a way where you regrounded it in the um, actual historical context. Because they talk about 
when you slay the dragon, you can actually build things from it. And they talk about the it's pieces, uh, right? Heaven and earth were yeah, made it's from amazing. it. And I thought, wow, it's kind of interesting. And then you said, no, no, no. They actually used to build the, you know, the doorways to their cave or whatever from the bones of the animals that they slayed. And I thought, oh my God, when you put the story in that context of you're telling the tribe something that they're actually doing, but you're elevating it. And so you're saying, mm -hmm. look, the great hero goes and slays the most dangerous of the most dangerous predatory thing. And from that, we're not just creating our house, we're creating the heaven and the earth. And I thought, whoa, like you really do. So I'm gonna- well, That's why in Christianity, which is, has taken the hero myth in a, in a tremendously sophisticated direction, Christ tackles the worst of all potential dragons and that's the adversary. That's the evil in the human heart. It's become completely psychologized by that point or spiritualized instead of an external monster that's the threat. And let's make no mistake, external monsters are, the, are threatening. But then there's the ex external monsters that are other tribes. Well, those are genuinely threatening too. And we can demonize a member of another tribe at the drop of a hat. But then you take one level above that even, you think, well, the most dangerous thing of all is the evil that lurks in the human heart, in the individual. And that's why you have the battle, let's say, between Christ and Satan. That's what that means. It's not all it means, but that's what it means. And, and so what do you, and then you ask yourself, like you can ask yourself this question very seriously. If you were thinking about the most moral possible action, wouldn't that be the voluntary constraint of the evil that you yourself are likely to do? And wouldn't that mean facing human evil in its reality as it manifests itself inside you? And wouldn't that mean then obtaining victory over that? And you might say, well, is that a divine story? Well, it's the... It, I can't say what the relationship is between the human psyche and, and the world as such, but we don't have a deeper story than that. And I can't see how it's not true. And you might say, well, it's not true for me. It's like, well, don't you have a conscience? Doesn't it bother you? And then can you control it? And the answer to that is almost inevitably no. It calls you to account. And why? Well, because you've deviated from the ideal. Whose ideal? An ideal that's making itself known within you, at least in so far as the objection arises. You wake up at three in the morning and torture yourself for your iniquities. And you would think, well, I could just shut that off. It's me after all. But you can't shut it off. You're nothing compared to your conscience. Now, it's strange because you can ignore it. You can not live according to its dictates, but it's not going to leave you alone. Jordan, you asked the Times person uh, in the full-length article or full-length recording, which I listened to. You said, hey, don't focus on my illness in this. Focus on why people resonate with my message, which she, of course, did not. Uh, but that leaves... No one does. Oh, it leaves me an opening. That, I'm going to take so it right now. It's so, so interesting to see that, is that it's so interesting because, you know, the only time that ever gets addressed is by, by the mainstream media, Jesus, you know, a horrible cliche, but it's usually sort of brushed off and it's usually, well, he seems to be attractive towards young men who are troubled. Well, first of all, that's not so bad, is it? I mean, hypothetically, the most ardent feminist is primarily concerned with helping the troubled young man not be so troubled, but it's brushed off in a cynical sort of way. And it, it, the cynicism is also disbelief that that could possibly be serious, a serious enterprise. Well, I think it's a serious enterprise. Why do you it's think they resonate serious. with you? I think it's because who knows the final answer to anything, you know? But I took what I learned about what happened in the Second World War seriously. It's like, wow, we can be really bad. We should do something about that. Like, that was unacceptable. Well, was it or not? Well, how unacceptable? Was it change your life unacceptable? Better be. 
if you want it not to happen again. And it's not like it, the next time it happens will make the previous time look like a picnic. We're way more powerful than we were. You know, when we're getting to the point of something Jung talked about, especially near the end of his life, we're getting so powerful that each individual is now a force of almost unimaginable destructive power if they so choose to be. And that's just going to, that power is going to continue to increase. And what that means is that the degree to which each of us has our act together is going to be something upon which the world increasingly depends for its maintenance. Also, to make sure you're actually taking action after watching this video, I've designed a special free worksheet just for this video. The worksheet will highlight all of the lessons learned in this video, as well as pull out our three favorite learnings and quotes that will inspire you to actually do something. The worksheet will also give you space to write down what your key takeaways are and your specific plan of action to make sure you're getting results. If you want the worksheet designed specifically for this video, absolutely for free, there's a link in the description below. Go click on it and start building the momentum in your life and your business. I'll see you there. Rule number four, aim for sustainable improvement. Alan Watts has this quote yeah. where he says, we can become so consumed with trying to improve our lives that we all together forget to live them. Is there a way that people can learn to let go of this compulsion a little bit? That, that's a really good question. Um, I think my, my second book implicitly answers some of that um, and explicitly some of it as well. But the implicit part is there's an increased emphasis on social ties. And so for me... I snap out of the improvement slash productivity trap to the degree that I'm able when I'm playing with my family, let's say, when we're joking, when we're sitting around a meal time together, when, when there's peace there and we can joke and play. And I'm trying, as particularly as I'm trying to regain my health, I'm trying to really rekindle that capacity to play and enjoy the moment even if I'm not doing something productive. And there, that, that's a very difficult balance to attain. Optimally, like any optimal balance, is difficult to attain. Um, you know, it isn't obvious to me how much of, I have no idea the, the, the multiple sources of my health troubles. I was diagnosed this month with severe sleep, central sleep apnea. And so that was a great relief because I have a machine now, so I breathe properly. I was waking up uh, 25 times an hour, apparently. My sleep was, so I was getting no restorative sleep. And so that was one contrib major contributor. And since I've been breathing at night, I've actually been feeling quite a bit better, unsurprisingly. Um, but I've been scouring my conscience to determine if you have an undiagnosed illness, especially if it's severe, it's very likely that you're going to tear yourself apart looking for what you did wrong to have this arise. And, you know, I think that I, it, so I've been considering, did I take on too much responsibility? Did I work too much, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I don't know the answer to that yet. But what I do know is that since I've been trying to regain my health, I've been doing a lot of walking and that's been really good. And I'm not working while I'm walking, I'm walking and I've been working out more and I've been playing more and I've been dancing more and that's all useful. And that has to be balanced with that productivity because what you're looking for, eh? you're looking for improvement, but you're looking for sustainable improvement. And so if you push yourself too hard, you, you destroy the sustainability across time. And, and you want this, that sustainability there. So you can't push yourself any farther than you're capable of going in the long run. I found, for example, because I've written diligently for a long time, daily, and I learned quite early on that writing more than three hours in a day was counterproductive. Whatever I gained from a four-hour writing session, I'd lose the next day or two. So 
but I also think you have to kind of push yourself past your limits before you can retract to the optimal place. And that can't be sort of defined a priori because each person's limit is different. And I think, so I think what you do when you're young in your twenties, if you're perhaps, if you're operating in an optimal manner is you push yourself to your limits and then pull back and adjust for sustainability. And I help lots of people do that in my clinical practice. Like I work with lawyers who, who are at the pinnacle of their profession and the demands on them are incredible. They're working 60 to 80 hours a week. Um, generally what I did with them was get them to take more days off. They couldn't work shorter days, but they could plan four day weekends, two months in advance. And they could do that every two months. Then inevitably, if they did that, the number of billable hours they produced went up, not down. So they maybe doubled their vacation time and increased their productivity. So it was a really good deal for them. They got their cake and eat it too. They got to have their cake and eat it too. So do we need to, need to learn to play in a way? Play can be... Uh, we need to remember how. We all know, right? I mean, we're, play is so deeply embedded in human beings. It's, it's one of our primary modes of, of, of cognition and adaptation. Mammals have a specialized play circuit that's, 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 that's biologically, what would you say, specialized precisely for play. And so, and it, it's an interesting circuit because a, a, a lot of this has been discovered by people who study animal behavior, especially among rats. But play in rats produces prefrontal lobe development and that's the highest, that's the part of the brain that's responsible for highest order cognition. So rats have to play a lot to mature properly and, and they play socially and social play is social integration. There's no difference between the ability to play socially and being socially integrated. Um, like a good conversation at a dinner time is a form of play because there's wit involved and there's banter and there's timing and there's a dance and there's you know, there's the matching of your physical responses to the physical response of the other person. It's it's play. But play is very easily inhibited by almost any other motivational state. And so you can also tell that if you can get yourself into a playful mood that that you're in an optimal place. Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to do it. So it's a good sign that things are going right. Rule number five, be devoted towards love. Andrea asks a question which I think a lot of people have absolutely no framework for because we live in an era of the collapse of marriage in our society, you know, uh, the complete sort of breakdown of the family unit, unit that you were describing a moment ago, Dr. Peterson. Uh, and so Andrea asks, what is the secret to a healthy and happy marriage? I think that's, it's actually a very well composed question, a healthy and happy marriage. I actually don't think it's a good question. Wow. <laughs> and I'll, I'll tell you, I'll tell you why. I mean, I think happy is a pretty low goal. I mean, first of all, there's going to be lots of times in your marriage where you are seriously not happy. And sometimes that's going to be because you're having conflict with your partner, but sometimes it's going to be because all hell's broken loose around you. Mm. And then if, if you judge the success of your marriage on your happiness, like then the same thing happens if you judge your success in life on the basis of your happiness. What do you have when it's nothing but suffering? And that's going to be plenty of your life. And so the whole orientation of that question in that sense is wrong. What you want to have in your marriage is, I would say, first of all, first and foremost, uh, like a scrupulous honesty. And I don't just mean that you tell each other the truth, because you can be brutal with the truth. I mean the kind of honesty that's devoted towards thriving in love, you know? And you want to act nobly in your relationship. You want to be reliable and productive and generous and, and... And then if you're lucky, now and then, you might be happy. And you might have a clear enough conscience so that in those rare moments where you are truly happy, you can also enjoy it without guilt. And so you aim at something a lot higher than happiness, and then you welcome it if it 
deigns to land on you for brief moments of time. Rule number six, turn chaos into order. How do you frame that? How do you take that emergent chaos and make habitable order out of it? You don't know. Is the whole capitalist system rotten to the core? I mean, that's a convenient explanation under those circumstances, that's for sure. Were you working for a psychopathic son of a bitch? Did you make the wrong choice in university and was that your father's fault because you never did what you want or was it your fault for not standing up to him? Or is it a dying industry or is maybe this a wake up call that you should go do something else that you've been waiting to do, you know, that you've actually wanted to do your whole life and that's why you're doing such a miserable job at your current occupation because you're bitter and resentful about the fact that you never did what you want. You don't know, it's all of those things at once. And that's very stressful because all of those things at once is too many things. And that's the reemergence of chaos. That's the flood. That's the return to the beginning of the cosmos. That's another way that it's been represented mythologically. It's that you voyage all the way back to the beginning of the cosmos when there's nothing but undifferentiated chaos. And that's what you're confronting. And maybe it's too much for you. And often it is. I mean, that, that can really, that can be tra traumatizing. It can hurt your brain. You know, it's just too much for you to bear. But it doesn't matter. You're stuck with it. And so how do you respond to that? Well, some of it is catastrophic negative emotion. You freeze and that's protective. And maybe you don't even want to move. You don't want to bloody well get out of bed for a week. And that's because your body is reacting as if the bedroom floor is covered with snakes and the best thing for you to do is just not move. Just freeze. Not a pleasant situation to be in because it's you're hyper aroused, very, very physiologically demanding. And there's zero about it that's productive except maybe the snakes won't see you. But they've already seen you so that isn't helping very well. So you've got all this undifferentiated negative emotion, anxiety, fear, hurt, anger, guilt, shame, emotional pain, the whole plethora of catastrophes. And then maybe on the other side, lurking down there is, thank God I'm done with that job. I just bloody well hate it. I drag myself off to work every day. And there's a little part of my soul that's so goddamn happy I finally got fired that I can hardly stand it. You know, and maybe you don't even admit that to yourself because, well, that would mean that all that time you spent at the job was just sunk cost. You're deluding yourself the whole time. Um, it is in an interesting thing to consider, though, sometimes if you're in the unpleasant circumstance of having to fire someone. You know, sometimes firing someone is the best thing that can happen to them, which doesn't mean that you should go out and, like, enjoy it. Although I have met very disagreeable people who actually enjoyed firing people. I'll tell you a story about that at some point because it's quite interesting. But, you know, sometimes if someone's just limping along in their job and doing it as miserably and wretchedly as they possibly can imagine, the best thing you can do to them, for them, is to say, you know, you're failing at this. <laughs> and, and that doesn't necessarily mean that you would have to be failing at absolutely everything else in the entire world. So maybe you should just accept the damn failure and go off and try something new. And I mean, that's terrifying for people, and I know they hate it and all that, but, but, but sometimes it's better than the alternative, which is just slow, torturous death. So here's a funny way of looking at it. So let's say you fall right into that hole that's underneath any, everything and you've hit an anomaly that you don't understand. You say, what's that anomaly made out of? Exactly. I know that's a strange way of thinking about it, you know, because it's not, well, you could say, we'll just go along with that. It's a metaphor. What's that anomaly made out of? Well, here's a way of thinking about it. It's made out of spirit and matter. And here's why. This is something I learned in part from Piaget. He said, well, it's made out of matter because, of course, that's the world, matter, and the world is also what matters, and so that's kind of a nice duality there. But it's made out of spirit because when you encounter something anomalous and go down the rabbit hole, when you go into the underworld that's underneath everything that you've relied on, you learn things down there. So what's down there is information. And that now it's maybe way more information than you want, but it is information. It's information. And what can, you, what can you do with the information? You can inform yourself with the information, right? You can put yourself in formation with the information. That's helpful too. And so, and you think, well, you, you're a psyche. Maybe you're not a spirit. It depends on, you know, whether you're a materialist or not. But at least we can say that you're a psyche. The question is, what's your psyche made of? Well, it's obviously got a material substrate. 
but the, the matter happens to be arrayed in, in a particular order, and that's an information order. And so when you fall into the underworld that's underneath everything and you encounter that latent information, then what you can do is enhance your psyche. You can grow your spirit because what you do is you take the new information and you incorporate it. That's like eating the apple that, that Adam and Eve ate. You incorporate that and that makes more of you. And that's not a metaphorical or a metaphysical proposition. It's, not, it's to say nothing other than, well, that's what happens when children learn. You th think of what happens. Charles III has a pretty low resolution representation of the world and is a fairly low resolution human being. Got all the constituent elements there, but isn't differentiated in any tremendous manner. That's all still to come in the future. And so what does the child do? Explore. Well, what do they explore? Things they don't understand. That's where the information is because you already understand what you understand. There's no information there. You go where there where you don't understand, that's where the information is. And out of that information, you generate a higher resolution world and you generate a higher resolution self. And so out of the combat with the underlying dragon of chaos, you generate spirit and matter. And that's what you do when you go down into the underworld. So if it doesn't kill you, or if it doesn't make you wish you were dead, which it probably will, but there's a bunch of you that has to die down there anyway, so maybe that's not such a bad thing because if you had this relationship that ended in betrayal, then there's something that's just not exactly right, right? There's something that went, and the reason I'm saying that, you think, well, that's kind of moralistic. It's like, actually, I don't mind being moralistic in case you haven't noticed, but, <laughs> but that's not a, it's not a fair comment because you're playing this stupid game. It's like you live with someone in fidelity. That's the game, right? You've decided the rules. With the game comes a morality. The morality are the rules of the game. Well, then the thing collapses into infidelity. It's like, well, you played the game wrong or it was the wrong game. One of those two. You, it's one of those two. You pick the damn game. And having picked the game, you can't all of a sudden say, well, no, those aren't the rules. It's like, yeah, yeah. If you pick the game, you pick the rules. And if you fail at complying with the rules, then you failed. Now, you could say, well, I could pick a different game. It's like, I don't care how you solve the problem. You're still stuck with the problem. It's a moral problem, fundamentally. And it might take some major league retooling to, to fix it. So you're at point A, trying to get to point B. That's not working out. You hit an anomaly. You're not getting to point B, that's for sure. You're a medical school student, you write your MCATs, which is this test you have to write to go to medical school, you get 25th percentile. I don't know who you are, but you're not a pre-med student. And maybe you never were, right? And that's the rub, man. And so, who the hell are you? You don't know. Collapse down here into this motivational conflict, this place of motivational and emotional uncertainty and tremendous information, right? It's a place of transformation. It's the phoenix that burns. It's the burning part of the phoenix that burns. It's, it's the journey to the underworld. It's the journey to hell. It can really be a journey to hell because you may find out that the reason that your partner betrayed you or that you didn't get your damn promotion is because there is seriously something wrong with you and you know it. And I don't just mean that you don't know what you're doing. I mean that there's 25% of you that is seriously aiming at things not being good. And so you fall into the underworld and you find out that, oh, oh God, I just got exactly what I was aiming for. Or I got exactly what the worst part of me was aiming for. And that worst part, that's something to clean up and that's not gonna be easy because it's got its hooks in me like something something ferocious, something seriously ferocious. And I've been toying with it for a very long time and maybe I can't even detach it anymore. And so that's not so fun. And you see people like that in psychotherapy very frequently or you see them wandering around on the streets like absolute catastrophic former shells of themselves, you know, because they've hit the underworld and they ended up in hell and there's no getting out of it. And so those are the people you tend to give a wide berth to when you walk down the street. And rule number seven, the last one before some very special bonus clips, is heal your trauma. You mentioned sexual shame, um, and it triggered something in me about just the shames of the past that people tend to hold on to. I think I, I might have mentioned this to you the last time we talked. I'm not sure if you know, but I was, I was sexually abused when I was five by a man that I didn't know. And for 25 years, I held on to the secret, the shame. Uh, and if anyone ever knew about this, 
then I would never be loved. I, you know, I'm right. Gonna, Cause you I, feel I, contaminated eh, permanently. I, yeah. I would, you know, I wouldn't have any guy friends. No girls would find me attractive. My parents would disown me. You know, I went down the rabbit hole of these stories of, you know, I'm the only one this has ever happened to. I never saw any examples of this happening to. Right. Uh, and about eight years ago, I, I started to really heal that and start sharing that shame in, in many different therapeutic experiences that allowed me to start the healing process. Uh, I'm curious from your perspective with all the work that you've done, what is the best approach for someone to really heal their shame? If Whether it's around sexual abuse or trauma or just anything, whether it be small or big or any type of shame that they might have, how does someone release shame in a healthy manner so that it doesn't make them a prisoner of these emotions of the past that hold them back? Well, you hinted at a few things when you just described what, what happened to you is you said, well, first of all, you know, I thought I was the only person this had ever happened to. It's like, no, it's a universal human experience to one degree or another. Now, you know, I'm not saying everyone was sexually abused, and I'm certainly not saying that some people aren't sexually abused to a degree that's so extreme, it's unimaginable where there are others, you know, get off relatively lightly, but it's still, it's, it's well within the realm of normative human experience that sexual that sex goes wrong in some way. At least you regret something that's happened, something you've done or something that was done to you. So the, putting it in to, when, when you're the only person that something has happened to, that's really not good, mm. right? Because it alienates you even from yourself. You have no idea what to do with that. And so that's sometimes why people find it such a relief to have their illness diagnosed. It's like, oh, there is, this is known. There's a category. Other people have had this experience. Maybe there's a pathway through it. Mm. So just knowing that you're not the only person like that can be very helpful. Um, updating, it's like, how you were how old? Five. Okay. Well, one thing to realize when you're 25 and you were abused when you're five is that you're not five anymore. Right. Right? That the person to whom that happened is no longer there. You're there, but so, you know, you might feel afraid of relationships. You might feel afraid of all sorts of things, but a lot of that was, you're sort of feeling that like that residual five-year-old. Mm -hmm. I tell a story about one client I had. She was abused by her older brother and she told me this story and I drew a picture in my head while she was, you know, I kind of pictured her of at five and this teenage hulking teenager, you know, taking advantage of her. But as she told the story, I realized that her older brother was only a year, two years older than her. Mm. Well, he was seven. It was like, okay, well, they were, she wasn't the victim of a tyrannical male in some sense. She, they were two badly supervised children. Now, that doesn't mean that what he did was right, but she was still the five-year-old in the memory, but she was 27 when, or so when she came to see me. And so the first thing I did was just point that out. It's like, think about the seven-year-olds you know, mm -hmm. right? From, for a five-year-old, a seven-year-old is an adult, but for an adult, a seven and a five-year-old are clearly both children. Well, that just changed things somewhat. It, it made her feel less vulnerable in the moment. Mm -hmm. What your brain wants from you in relationship to a traumatic memory is indication that you're no longer vulnerable to the same problem. That's what memory is for, right? Mm -hmm. You remember something bad and you process it so that you change your interpretation or your behavior or the situation or whatever you can change so that it isn't going to happen in the future. And that'll, if you do that thoroughly, you'll generally let yourself rest. Mm -hmm. It's to, you have the memory to protect yourself from it happening again. Well, that's the purpose of memory in general. Right. You, 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 you make sense of your past behavior so that bet, the good things that happen to you can be duplicated and the bad things can be avoided. It's not to make an objective record of the world. Mm. It's to make a functional map of the world that you can apply to the future. And so 
So how part do we, of, yeah, how do we let that go? How do we disassociate something that happened a year ago, 10, 20 years ago that is no longer happening, but is seems to be triggering us? Oh, it's very, kind of, it's, it's, it's very difficult. Well, I would say, you know, one of the things you need to develop if you've had an experience like the one you had, perhaps, because I don't know the details, you probably need a theory of malevolence. You need an explanation. Mm. It's like, how could a person do that? Well, you have to have an... What if the explanation isn't good? They were just a bad person. They just... Well, then you need a philosophy of bad. Mm. You need a philosophy of evil. You have to understand it so that you're no longer a victim of it. Uh. You have Because otherwise you can't put the event in a, in a context. Right. You know, and sometimes that means the development of real a real philosophical sophistication. And that can help because then... You know, then you can start to separate out malevolence from benevolence because maybe you're afraid of any intimate relationship now because it's been contaminated with that and everything's fuzzy and foggy. And so you need to understand the person who did that, at least to some degree, so that you can separate that person out from all the other people around you who that you encounter in situations that might be reminiscent of it. You know, so you, you felt vulnerable for, for perhaps you felt ashamed. All those things have to be gone through. What do you think, you know, when you're ashamed, when does, what elicits that? Mm -hmm. What are the eliciting cues? What do you think when that happens? All of that has to be taken apart. I said in this Beyond Order book that, you know, if you have a memory older than about 18 months that still bothers you, right? It's still got emotional resonance that older, you should write 18, it out. Older than 18 months ago or before? Yeah. No, older than eight, 18 months ago or more. Got it. Yeah. Otherwise, it's not really in the past, right? It's still happening. Mm. That, that, that Whether you should delve into something, how you should delve into something traumatic that's currently happening is a whole different issue. But if it's an old memory and it still bothers you, it means that you haven't decomposed that experience sufficiently to detach it from the emo emotion. So imagine when something terrible happens to you, you don't understand it. Mm -hmm. So then you might say, well, if you don't understand something that's happening to you, how can it be terrible? Because doesn't terrible mean that you understand it? And the, the answer is, well, you understand things in stages. And the first way you understand a terrible thing is by freezing in terror or running. That's the understanding. It's not conceptual. It's embodied and emotional. And so, event terror, that's the first category. Okay, now, the next question is, how do you get it out? How do you get out of the terror? Well, you realize that nothing truly dangerous is happening. Well, what if something truly dangerous did happen? Mm -hmm. Then you elaborate your view of the world to the point where you're no longer vulnerable to that terrible thing. You speak about the concept of the soul. Um, do you associate this with any psychological constructs? Not any psychological constructs that are more valid than the notion of the soul. You no, know, there's, there's, I would say, what we mean by soul is something like animating spirit. And you might say, well, what's a spirit? And well, that's actually rather easy to answer. So when a child of four is playing house, let's say when a child of four is playing house, she acts out the role of the mother. But acting out, that's a strange thing, right? Because she doesn't literally duplicate in her actions or her perceptions in the game, what she observed her mother literally doing. So for example, she didn't go into her mother's bedroom when her mother awoke and watched her turn her head in a particular way to awaken and count the number of blinks so that she could mimic that in her play. And you know, you think that's absurd, but it's not absurd if it's just mimicry. It's not. 
It's unbelievably sophisticated. So what the girl does is she watches her mother manifest maternal behavior across a vast array of instances, and she integrates that with the image of the mother she's received from all the books she's been read and all the little movies she's watched, the Disney movies and so forth, and she abstracts out the animating principle of the maternal, and then she embodies that in play, and usually with a little boy, and that's practice for what's going to come later. It's unbelievably sophisticated, and she's embodying a spirit, and the spirit there is the abstraction of the central animating principle from multiple embodiments of its manifestation. And if you think children can't do that, well, then you don't know anything about children, because they do that all the time in their pretend play, which is a necessary precursor to healthy psychological development. And so part of what we refer to as the soul is the presence of that spirit, or maybe even the capacity of embodying such spirits. And it's very difficult to know how deep that goes. You know, I had a vision at one point of all the men in my life who've been particularly influential in a benevolent way. You know, and so, and you think, well, just a mere notion of the idea that there could be a benevolent way that would unite the acts of benevolence across a series of men, that's all comprehensible to you. That's, you take that as a matter of course when you say that there are such things as good men and you can identify them, right? Something stable about whatever is good across multiple manifestations of, of incarnation, let's say. And I saw that transform into the, the father person of the Trinity as the embodiment of that benevolent spirit. Now, I don't have any idea what that means metaphysically, because who does? But, but that, that spirit manifesting itself within is certainly part of what we refer to when we talk about the soul. And you can see that shine through people. I mean, it's part of what gives someone charisma. It's part of what elicits the instinct to imitate in you. You know, when you see that even in simple things, when you see a remarkable athlete do something incredibly athletic to put the goal, to put the soccer ball, the football ball through the net to score the goal and everybody leaps to their feet in celebration of that, well that's, that's a celebration of the divine capacity to hit the target dead on and it grips you at such a, lo a low level, way down inside your soul that you're compelled to your feet to cheer and you don't even know what you're doing. But you enjoy it, that's for sure, and that enjoyment is also a sign of the depth and utility of that response. You see this in all, all the things that people do that are you know, so-called popular entertainment. It's unbelievably sophisticated. The soul is participating in that in the fullest extent. And you know, you can say, well, there's no use for the religious, there's no necessary use for the religious terminology. It's like, well, until you come up with a better word, there's plenty of use for it because it's a very complex and deep phenomena. And to, you know, just cast it into the realm of superstition in some casual manner is it's just not helpful. Not in any possible, it's not helpful scientifically, it's not helpful ethically, it's not helpful existentially. Try treating someone for a while as if they don't have a soul. Just really, I mean it, just, you know, treat them like a deterministic machine, if that's your belief. Really act it out. You'll be like the most hated person in town in about 15 <laughs> minutes. Well, I mean, what do you make of practical evidence like that? I mean, you interact with people as if they're free souls capable of choosing between good and evil. That's what you do all the time. And maybe you can addle yourself out of that by some ridiculous rationalist ideology, but that just means you're kind of a gabbling fool, and it's just going to make you trip over things you don't even notice in all of your social interactions. And you tell me, I don't care how you think philosophically or ideologically, you bloody well know that what I just said is true. So, and that's true even when you're interacting with an infant or a small child. It's true when you're dealing with someone who's elderly and, and virtually incapacitated in every way. You still see that divine spark, for lack of a better term, and we do lack a better term, by the way. You see that everywhere if your eyes are open and if you're willing to see it, and to the degree that you're responsive to that, then your actions are guided by love and your words are guided by truth. You need that instinct for meaning too. So, and, and we should get this real straight. Why do you need it? Well, you need it because life is really, really difficult, right? I mean, 
people have a rough time of it. There's plenty of suffering in life and everyone is going to encounter it, right? They're, they're, you, don't, you, know, you learn this as a clinical psychologist and you know this generally, you know, unless you're an extraordinarily fortunate person. Um, you don't have to talk to someone for very long and, and really talk to them and get beneath the surface until you find, you know, there's a tragedy or two or three or 10 lurking not very far beneath the surface. Someone in the family is very ill. There's a childhood history of extreme pathology, alcoholism somewhere in the family, maybe a touch of insanity. Someone has cancer. You know, someone, some an older relative is dying. There's financial trouble. There's economic trouble. There's marital trouble. It's like life is trouble. And now, you know, it, it, that doesn't mean it's all trouble, but man, it's trouble. And sometimes it's, it's a lot of trouble. And sometimes it's so much trouble that you can, you can barely stand it. And, and you see that because people, you know, people get depressed and they commit suicide. And the reason they do that is because they think not being is better than being. And that's quite the decision, you know? So, and, and it's not that uncommon among people who are depressed. And so it's, it's, a, it's a very, it's a very, important thing to consider. And it, and it isn't just a matter of depression and suicide, that's bad enough. But, you know, if you're unhappy because your suffering has pushed you past the point of your ability to cope, then there's all sorts of other things that can happen to you that aren't directed towards you. You can become cynical and you can become bitter and you can become cruel and you can become narcissistic and deceitful and arrogant. And, and it's like, everything's for you, and then you're out for revenge. That's a nice one. I don't know against who, but maybe everyone. Maybe even including you, because you're not happy about the role you've played in generating your own misery. I mean, there's a lot of darkness underneath the suffering, and so, and, and, and that's, that's an ever-present existential danger for human beings, you know? We're aware of the future, we're aware of our fragility, we're aware of our mortality. It's something that makes us truly unique truly conscious in a way that no other creature is and capable of things that no other creature can do, but also bearing an unbelievably heavy existential load. We're the only creatures that have to always contend with the fact that we're finite and that everyone we know is in the same position, that allied with the suffering. And so that's there all the time. And, and you know, even, even in, in the brightest moments, in some sense, you know, in, in, in Renaissance paintings, in, in still lifes, they used to put a memento, a memento mori often in the, in the still life, like a skull somewhere in the corner, or sometimes, sometimes in, a, in, in a very strange perspective so that you could only see the skull if you were standing like right beside the painting instead of dead on. But the idea was to always remember, you know, that everything that exists is tainted or touched with the, with the, with the, with the, with the taint of mortality. And, you know, that's rough, but there, there's some useful things in it. It keeps you awake and it, it keeps you focused if you're careful, but it also does indicate to you, if you think about it, the necessity of having a meaning in your life. Because, because if it's true intrinsically that life has this unbearable element of suffering, which seems to be completely in, in what would you say, indisputable as far as I'm concerned, and it's worse than that too, because it's not just suffering, it's suffering contaminated with malevolence, right? It's, it's bad enough to have something bad happen to you, and it's likely that that'll happen. But it's even worse for you to do it to yourself and to know that you did it. That's rough. And it's also extraordinarily rough to be betrayed by someone else or, you know, tyrannized by your own culture. And so, and that's, that's not just suffering. That's like unnecessary and pointless suffering that's been directed at you by something that wants that to happen. And so both of those are very, very powerful, let's say, archetypal forces, suffering and malevolence, and we have to deal with them at every level of reality. And you need something to, you need something to push back against that. It's not optional if that's the default position, and I think it's the default position. Like, a meaningless life isn't meaningless. It's suffering and malevolence. That's not good. And, and if that's acted out, you know, that, that's the other thing. If that's acted out, and I, I've read the accounts and the actions of people who've taken a very vicious turn into the darkest parts of the underworld, consequence of their resentment and their malevolence, and then their desire to make 
everything in the world suffer for the outrage of its existence, man. I mean, that's how we turn things into hell. If you want to know why totalitarian states take the brutal twists they take and why people are motivated to do the absolutely terrible things that they do, well, that's why, is that the suffering and the malevolence that's intrinsic to life overwhelms them and, and they turn and they turn in a very bad direction and then they make everything that's already bad way worse and we're very, very inventive at such things. And so that's not good unless that's the path you want. That's a bad idea. You need an alternative and that's meaning. I don't know how many of you have read Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment, but I would highly recommend that in Crime and Punishment, the protagonist commits the perfect murder and he has his reasons for it, and, mo and many reasons, because Dostoevsky didn't mess around when he wanted to give someone reasons, he gave them reasons, and Raskolnikov, the main character, had reasons for murder, and then he commits his murder, and he gets away with it, but things don't go well for Raskolnikov, because one of the things he finds out is that the Raskolnikov that you were before you committed the murder is not the same as the Raskolnikov as you are after you've committed the murder. And there's a dividing line there that you don't, it's like the red pill, I guess, right? It's in, like, it, that's the matrix, correct? The red pill? And once there's certain actions, once you take them, there's no going back. And so that's what crime and punishment is about. And Raskolnikov tortures himself to death, well, not literally, but metaphysically, psychologically, because he cannot tolerate breaking the great moral code. And so it's, it's a great book. It's truly a great book. And, and, and it's also extraordinarily, like it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a murder mystery thriller as, as well as being a deep philosophical book. So if you're in the mood for, you know, a murder mystery thriller that's also a deep philosophical book, then that's the one for you. Human consciousness is that faculty that confronts potential itself. I think there's good neurological evidence for this, by the way, for those of you who are scientifically minded, because uh, we build circuits within us for habitual action that we've practiced many times that seem to run in a very deterministic fashion. And we are a strange combination of deterministic and non-deterministic, as far as I can tell. But what our consciousness seems to be for is to encounter those things that we have not yet encountered. And those things that we have not yet encountered seem to me to be those things that have not yet been brought into being. And so you could say that what our consciousness is for is for the encounter with potential. You know, that our consciousness is for the... It's not for the past, it's not even for the present. It's to transform the future into the present. And, and really that that's what our consciousness does. When you wake up in the morning, you have a new day ahead of you and the day could take you in very many directions. And, and the weeks and the years, all of that can take you in very many directions. And you have some apprehension about what those directions might be. You have some apprehension about what role your choices might make in transforming that potential into one form of actuality or another. I mean, you certainly know that there are dreadful mistakes that you might be very tempted to make that would produce all manner of hell around you and still be tempted to do it. It seems like it's sitting there right in front of you as a possibility. You also know that, you know, you could haul yourself up out of bed and attend to your duties and do the sorts of things that you're supposed to and set a few things right that day and that week and that likely things would at least not be worse and they would probably be better. And uh, I, I believe that, I do believe that, I, I don't understand how this can be the case. I don't understand how it is that consciousness, consciousness can function in that way because I think to understand that, we would have to understand what it means for the future to be only potential rather than actuality, and who the hell understands that? I mean, no one. And then we'd have to understand how it is that our conscious choices and our conscious ethical choices transform that potentiality into actuality, into reality, into the present and the past. And we certainly 
But we certainly act as if we believe that that's what we do. We upbraid ourselves. For example, when we do a bad job of it, we're upset with our children and those we love if we don't believe that they're living up to their potential. We're guilty and ashamed when we make choices that we feel are inappropriate. We understand to some degree that the manner in which time lays itself out has something to do with the ethics of our choice. And again, I would say that's a very deep idea. I think it's, a, I think it's, I think it's the most true idea I know. It's very emphasized, that idea emphasized in ancient religious stories such as those that are outlined in Genesis or in Genesis with its strange insistence that, you know, God is that which brings order out of chaos, formless potential, generates the world out of formless potential, and that we're somehow made in that image, which, which seems to me to be the case. And that the proper way, by the way, to go about acting in that image is to act in relationship to the potential that confronts you with truth and with courage, with careful articulation, that's the logos, and that if you do that, then what you bring forth is, is good. Genesis, one of the things God has Adam do first. So God makes the world by speaking. Okay, so that's the first thing to think about. You're supposed to think like in a sophisticated way about this. The idea is that there's some integral relationship between communication and the structure of being. It's part of the role that consciousness plays in the world, whatever that role is. Language takes the chaos and makes it into things. And so, God has Adam name all the animals. They're, they're not even really real until they have names. Now, they're more implicit, that's another... You know, here's an, here's an example, let's say that you're having a rough patch in your relationship, and you don't know why. It's unnameable. Is it real? Well, yeah, it's manifesting itself in a, like a physiological discomfort. Then you talk about it and you name it. It's like, it goes from this blurry thing that's kind of potential, it goes snap, mm -hmm. and then it's this thing, right? And then that's a horrible thing. It's like a little poisonous thing, but it's not a whole foggy cloud of potential poison. It's like this little sharp poison thing. And then you think, okay, it's real. It's a little monster, but it's not, it's little at least, and now probably we can do something about it, if we can admit to it. So it's this precision that's specified. You've got to name them first. Absolutely, because the unnameable is far more terrifying than the nameable. You see that in, there was a great Blair Witch Project. Mm -hmm. Terrifying movie. Oh, I thought it's it was scary. brilliant. That, yeah, yeah. Well, it's unnamed. There's nothing terrible happens in that movie. It's all the unnameable. It's like, what's going on? What's going on? What's going on? And... No matter how terrible the actuality is, it's rarely as terrible as your imagination. Because your imagination, like it's an old thing, it's seen a lot of terrible things in the history of life. Like, it can put monsters everywhere. And so it's almost always better, it might be better without exception, to name the thing, no matter how terrible it is. And if you can't name it, what that means is that you're, you're telling yourself that you're so terrified that you can't bring your attention to bear on it. And that makes you, you're the loser, instantly. If it's so terrifying that you cannot face it, it's won. My wife is a massage therapist and she's very physiologically aware. And so she's also helped me with this sort of thing. But we watch people on the streets all the time. And people in general now have very poor posture. Yeah. It's very bad for them. Well, I mean, that's that's got to be phone related too, right? We're all Well, yeah, all I think that's time. part of it. But I also think it's something our culture doesn't attend to. Like you kind of have to remind your kids to stand up. You know, it takes a certain amount of conscious effort. But yeah, in that chapter, I talk a lot about lobsters, which I'm, I'm kind of, I kind of have an affinity for lobsters. And because they, well, the, the short story is that when a lobster loses a fight, because they're fighting all the time for dominance, let's say, in their hierarchies, he kind of crunches down, so he looks smaller. When he wins a fight, he stretches out, looks bigger. And so he's signaling to other lobsters the tally of his victories, mm -hmm. let's say. So if a lobster has won a fight, he's more likely to win the next fight than you would calculate from having a tally of all his previous defeats and victories. And if he loses a fight, then he's more likely to lose the next fight. So that's that, that Matthew principle at work. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you think, well, so what? So what does that have to do with anything? It's like, okay, here, part of the kicker is 
well, the lobster runs on serotonin, neurochemical. And if the lobster loses, the serotonin levels go down, and if he wins, the serotonin levels go up. And when the serotonin levels go up, he stretches out, and he's a confident lobster. And one of the consequences of that is if a lobster loses a battle, and you give him the equivalent of antidepressants, then he stretches out and he'll go fight again. So antidepressants work on lobsters, huh. right? And you think, well, who cares? It's like, no, 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 you don't get it. We diverged from lobsters from an evolutionary perspective 350 million years ago, and it's the same circuit. It's absolutely unbelievable. And that shows you how deep inside you, how basic, how primordial that circuit is in you that's sizing other people up and looking at where they fit in the hierarchy. Well, with human society, it's more like hierarchies of competence mm -hmm. than dominance per se. But, and like if your serotonin levels fall, you get depressed, you crunch forward, and, and the whole, everything around you turns cloudy and black, and, and then you're inviting more oppression, right? And so you get into this bad loop, you know, and so it's really important to, if you're trying to get your act together, it's really important to stretch yourself out and, and sit up properly because it's, it's part of the psychophysiological loop that can start you on the upward curve. And so it's a really important thing to take note of. And like if you've been bullied, say when you were a kid, maybe you've moved and so it's sort of irrelevant, you're still carrying that with you in the, in the sh hunched shoulders and then you can't breathe properly mm -hmm. and your voice isn't right and, and you invite more bullying because the predator types are always looking for people who who look like they can be intimidated and who mm -hmm. will make a nice fuss if they are, you know, like a nice gratifying, they'll make nice gratifying sounds of suffering. If you are where you are right now in your life and your business because of you, because of your mindset, your actions, your habits, your beliefs, you're where you're at because of you. It's nobody else's fault. You're not further behind. You're, you're not, you're not lower than you used to be. You're not further behind on your goals, but you're also not further ahead. You're not where you want to be. And it's because of you. It's not It's not the government's fault. It's not the tax, tax policy fault. It's not your country's fault. It's not your parents' fault, your education's fault. It's your friend's fault. It's none of those things. It's you. It's you, 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 it's you. And listen, at the beginning, that sounds like a lot of tough medicine. It's like, well, it's not my fault. I mean, Sure, it's my fault, but come on, look at what happened. COVID happened, you know, all this other stuff happened and it's easy to, to put the blame on something else. But when you can actually realize that you are where you are because of you, it's, it's not just a tough love, it's actually the most empowering thing of all time. Because when you take the responsibility, it doesn't mean that's your fault. Uh, it doesn't mean that you can change anything that you've done in the past, but it's your responsibility to get to a different place. It's not about assigning blame. It's about taking responsibility, which is the ability to respond, right? Responsibility equals the ability to respond. Do you have an ability to respond? Yes. When? Always. <laughs> COVID happened? Great. Do you have an ability to respond? Yes. What are you doing about it? And while most people are upset and complaining and waiting for the government to do something, you're off responding. You're off making a change. You're off making a difference, making a pivot, making new things happen. That's what separates successful people from everybody else. And I want that for you. So it recognizes that, okay, here, here I'm stuck here. This is where I am right now. I don't want to stay stuck here. I want to change. I want to grow. I've got a big mission that I have to go off and accomplish. How do you do that? You change your mindset. You change your beliefs. You change your habits. And it starts with you accepting responsibility for where you're at. I've got, you know, my main channel, 3 million subscribers. I'm not at 10. I'm not at one. I'm not at, I'm not at 50 subscribers. And so the point isn't beat ourselves up. I'm, I'm grateful for everything that I've done. I'll own the fact that, Hey, I, I, I got us to building an organization, a team, a structure, uh, making 10,000 videos to now, you know, I've got 3 million subscribers. Amazing. Great. Pat on the back. And I'm not at 10. I'm not a 10 because I need to get better. The videos need to get better. The team needs to get better. The strategy needs to get better. The production needs to get better. Everything needs to get better for me to get to where I want to go. It's easy for me to say, well, nobody's done that inside of thought leadership. Nobody's done it before. Nobody's, nobody has a 10 million subscriber channel inside of thought leadership. Nobody. 
I could say people don't care about education that much. I could say, well, I don't have as many resources as somebody who's further ahead or part of some giant corporation. I don't, I don't have as many resources. I could say, well, I'm, I'm introverted and shy and, uh, you know, and so I can't, I can't be great. You know, there's a, there's a ceiling to how good I can be. Right. And these are the kinds of thinking that are fear based that keep you small because we don't want to accept the responsibility because the responsibility feels like blame. And that's where we have to separate it. It's not about blame. It's not saying that you suck. It's not saying you should have done something different. It's not beating ourselves up. It's the ability to respond. I'm not trying to blame anything for where I'm at. And I hope you're not blaming yourself or anybody around you for where you're at. But it's taken on the ability to say, you know what, I, I don't want to end up in the same spot. If I'm a year from now and I'm still at X, right, then I'm going to be upset because I, I can't change. You can't change. So how do we do it? How do we start to develop that, that sense of responsibility? How do we start to actually take the action that we need to take action on? A couple things. One, change your environment. If you're surrounded by people, by thinking, where it's constantly complaining, especially blaming, like watch out for people who blame. Watch out for people who say, well, well it's, it's that person's fault, it's their fault, it's, it's this person's fault, it's their fault over there, and never accepting any responsibility. Or they're just constantly trying to blame other people, right? Watch out for those people. Don't be infected by their cancer. That's a cancer. That person is never gonna be happy. You need to really dramatically reduce the amount of time that you're spending with those kinds of people. And then inject it with more of the positivity, more of the optimism, more of the responsibility. Whatever you want more of in your life, if it's accepting responsibility, surround yourself with the people who are doing it. Surround yourself with the people who have that mindset, either in, in person or through videos like this. You know, you I may never meet you, but you can learn from this. I, you may never meet Jordan Peterson, but you can learn from this video, right? You can learn from their content, their videos, their books, their podcasts. So it's an immediate change in your environment because you are a product of your environment. Your environment impacts your subconscious. You're not even consciously knowing, but if you're around people who are blaming other people all the time, you're going to just by default start to blame other people, start to complain a lot of the time. You'll have to consciously make the shift to say, I don't want to be this person. Why am I complaining so much? Why am I so negative and nasty? Why am I blaming other people so much? Look at your environment. That's the reason why, right? So we're cutting out or, or restricting access to the people who are in that blaming, complaining mode, and we're injecting positivity in through humans, through videos, books, podcasts, etc. right? Step number one, change your environment. Step number two is recognize the situation for what it is no worse than it is but no better than it is what is the situation right now so if i'm looking at my my main youtube channel and i'm trying to grow it okay where am i at i'm at three million subscribers great it's no worse than it is it's not like oh i suck and i don't know what to do and i'm not grateful for anything that we built it's looking at what do i have i've I've got this channel, I've got some amazing, you know, people in the community. I've got an amazing team of people who help me. It's great for where I'm at. It's no worse than it is. We tend to beat ourselves up and feel like we're further behind. But it's also no better than it is. It's not where I want to be yet. And we're still not good enough at anything. We're not good enough at production, at thumbnails, at titles, at, at editing, at, at me being on camera. Like we're not good at we're not good enough at any of the stuff. None of it. Right? That's where we need to be. So you're changing your environment, step number one, to have a more optimistic, more positive, more energetic, more happy environment around this. Two, we're then looking at the situation for what is the truth of it? No worse than it is, but no better than it is. When it's worse, we, we pound on ourselves and tell ourselves we suck. When it's better, we feel like we don't have to change because everything is great, right? So no worse than it is, no better. And then three is what are your actual steps? What are you going to do? What's the plan of action? When you can look at the truth of the situation, what needs to actually improve? How do you actually start making progress towards your goals? What are the habits, routines, mindset, belief shifts that you need to make on a daily basis? Like what does today now look like? Not just in, in theory of I need to believe in myself more. Awesome. Yes, I love it. That's changing your environment. How does that apply to today? Like what are you going to do today that's different than what you did yesterday? What are you going to do? this week that's different than what you did last week. What's the new plan? What's the new plan that you're gonna execute on 
every single day to move closer to actually accomplishing your goals. And if you can follow that process, you can follow those steps and it's a, it's a continuous loop, right? You're never done on any of it. You're never done. You're always trying to improve your environment. Always. You're always trying to improve in your environment. You're always trying to see the world for what it is right now. See your situation for what it is right now. I know you're always trying to create a plan to then actually execute to help you get closer to your goals. Always. And, and that's not hopefully stressful to you because you always want to be growing. You always want to be learning. You always want to be improving. The, the day the progress stops, the day you stop liking your life. If there was no progress, no growth, no change, you wouldn't like your life. You'd be bored. Go get a job. That's that's what most people do. And most people don't like their life because they're in a really, really boring job. Right? So you, you have these steps on loop, on repeat. And that's how you start getting closer to becoming the person you want to be and achieving the goals that you want. At the start of all of this, though, it's still the accepting responsibility. Responsibility does not equal blame. You are where you are because of you, because of the choices that you made, because of the beliefs that you have, because the actions that you have taken. You are where you are because of those actions. And that's gotten you so far. And if you want to change, you want to grow, you want to improve, you want to hit your mission, you want to get closer to hitting your goals, you now have to take responsibility for the person you need to become to actually make those dreams a reality. Because you made it this far in a video, I want to celebrate you. Most people start and don't finish. Most people never actually follow through. Most people say they want something, but they don't ever do the work to actually get it. But you are different. You are special. Believe Nation, you made it here all the way to the end, and I love you. So it's a special celebration if you put a hashtag believe down in the comments below on this video, I will showcase you and celebrate you somewhere on the screen in a future video because you are awesome. If you want to become the person you want it to be with Jordan Peterson, check the video right there next to me. I think you'll love it. Continue to believe and I'll see you there. Don't make a plan that is what you should do. Make a plan that outlines a future so that you could sit back and say, look, if I had that future, then all the horrible things that are going to happen to me are going to be worthwhile. That's what you want.